Welcome to Creekwood United Methodist Church Online. We are so grateful that you've decided to worship with us virtually today. Thank you for joining us as we grow deep roots to share God's love. Here at Creekwood, we want to do everything we can to help you stay connected. Here are a few reminders for worshiping online. If you can, create yourself a sacred space as we worship together. Light a candle, open a Bible, just like we do in the sanctuary. When we stand together to sing or recite a creed, stand with us if you can so we can all participate together. Don't forget to say hi in the comment section. Even if you watch the service later, it's always good to connect in that way. Be sure to sign in online using the link in the comment section or go to creekwoodumc.org slash register to let us know you're attending. While you're online, add any prayer requests you might have. When it comes time for the offering, you can go to creekwoodumc.org, give tab, and give online, either through a credit card or an ACH transaction. You can set this up as a recurring gift if you'd like. Hey kids, when it's children's time, make sure that you come up real close to your device so that we can participate together. And we would love for you to be a part of Sunday School, so make sure that you email me for the Zoom link that is every single Sunday at 945. If you have any questions or any problems during the service, feel free to comment in the Facebook feed or send us a direct message. We are here to facilitate the best online worship experience possible for you. We're so glad you've decided to join us today. Whether this is your first time or hundredth time, we hope you have a really positive experience and we're really excited to be in worship with you today.
so glad to be here with you guys this morning. So blessed to be here with you guys. And you guys online, we're so glad you're joining us where every day we're growing deep roots to share God's love. Uh, we ask that you don't forget to sign in with us this morning. And if you're online, you can find the link in the comments. And let's just all take a minute to reset, to clear our minds. Let's just surrender everything that we have this morning so that we can allow the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place and in our hearts. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay in my head oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful
Let's pray together. Gracious and most loving God, we thank you for the ability and the privilege to gather together once more. We thank you for the technology that makes it possible to gather online and the safety measures that makes it possible to gather in person. God, for the person on our right and on our left and in front of us and behind us, we are thankful. We are thankful for the goodness of you that we see in every person. And God, today as we continue to worship you, we ask that we might be mindful of the ways in which you're continuing to work in our lives. The ways you are showing us your love. And God, for those who might need an extra measure of your grace or your love or your peace, we ask that they might receive it. And if needed, we might be the ones to give it. God, for all of those who are suffering from COVID-19 or still recovering, and especially for those who have lost someone to this, we ask that your comforting presence would be known. And God, we pray for all of those who are fleeing from wildfires this morning, that they might have a safe place to go. We ask that your peaceful presence would be among them as well. God, we love you. And it's your name we ask these things. Amen. I want to invite you to have a seat. We have a special treat for you as we celebrate the Lord's Prayer again together this morning. And we are going to hear it in one of the um, original biblical languages. So if you'll direct your attention to the screen. Avim Shiba Shaman, Yid Kadeshin Khan. Tavon Mabhutika is the Rizon Ka. But Arit Kashir Nasava Shamai and Nano Kayam Lakim Hukin. Usilak Nano Erash Patin. Kashir Sulikim and Akim Vashesh Munano. Veal Tivino Li De Masa, Kim Hatileno Minhara. Kileha, Hamamelecha, the Hagabara, the Hatif Ede, Le Olame, Olamim Ame. All right, you guys can stay seated. I ask that you just continue to pray and let's sing the song while we pray. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your high living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. holy spirit you are
Worshiping online. Welcome to Children's Time. We're glad to see you. Get up real close to your screen or your phone or how a computer, however it is that you're uh, worshiping today, and we'll get started. Okay. So, have you ever stopped to think about how many times a day we look at a clock? that we check what time it is? We look at clocks on the wall, we check the watch on the wrist. If you even wear that anymore, I don't know. I ditched mine a long time ago when I got my cell phone because that's, that's how I check the time, is through my cell phone. We are always checking the time. Now, some of you might be saying, Miss Allison, I am too young. I do not check the clock. I don't care what time it is. And if that is the case, I bet your parents do. I bet you hear your parents or your grandparents say, what time it is? What time is it? Oh my goodness, we're running late. Or it's time for bed. Just all sorts of different things. They're always time, time, time. We've got something to do. And I bet your teachers do that too. We hear them say, welcome to class. It's time to get started. Or it's time for math, time for recess, time to go home. That's the best part of the day. Yay, we love to go home, yes. <laughs> now don't get me wrong. Knowing what time it is, is a good thing. It's good to be on a schedule. And I have always said, if you are early, you are on time, right? So that is a good motto to follow. But here's something to think about. How many times do we say, it's time for church, it's time to pray, it's time to get out our Bibles and read, it's time to share Jesus with others. Some of us, yes, we say that. Some of us, maybe not, maybe not as often as we, we should or we want to. Sometimes we forget to make time for those little special moments with God. We do that. But here's a sentence, and this is kind of like a bunch of little words all together. We have the time to make the time. Does that make sense? Because it is. We have the time to make the time to be with God. So today is the last time, the last time, that we're going to open up our treasure chest. And I bet you know what's inside. It's a clock, yes? Now I want you to look at this clock really close. You'll notice it's not moving. This clock does not tell the time right now. It does not have a battery in the back. When we say the last sentence of the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We are saying that earth and heaven is God's and is forever. That we will be here on earth and in heaven with God forever. That God is mighty and God's power will know, we will know forever and ever. And that God is glorious because God has done and will continue to do great, great things forever. We don't need a clock for all of that, right? Today, our closing prayer is the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to say that here in just a minute, but here's what I want for you to remember, that God's kingdom, God's power, and God's glory is with us every hour, every minute, every second of the day, forever and ever. And so that's why uh, forever doesn't need a clock. Do you see? God's with us forever. Okay, so let's bow our heads and we're going to uh, close with the Lord's Prayer, but we're not going to go through our items because I think that we don't need these symbols to do that. I think we have it down now, right? Okay, so y'all say it with me. I'm just going to say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Y'all have a great week. So, uh, 
I want to introduce you to Dan and Chase Williams and their little bundle of joy, Alan James, who goes by AJ, uh, who has come to be baptized today. And it is through baptism, uh, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. And so we have here Alan James Williams presented for baptism. And so Dan and Chase, since AJ is not quite able to uh, speak for himself quite yet, maybe in a few months or so, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions as the primary spiritual influences uh, in his life right now. And so on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And if so, say, I do. I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And if so, say, I do. I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And if so, say, I do. I do. And will you nurture? The main reason I'm asking you these questions is, will you nurture AJ here in Christ's Holy Church that by your teaching example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life. And if so, say, we will. We will. Because that is totally a team effort. And he's wiggling at that. He's excited for this journey, <laughs> I can tell. Um, so I'm going to ask some uh, questions of you who are watching, and all of you can respond as well as Christ's body here. Um, so according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? And if so, say, we will. We will. And will you support AJ as he joins into the family of Jesus Christ, into the family of Creekwood United Methodist Church? Will you love him and respect him? Will you teach him the ways of faith and nurture him? And if so, say, we will. Yeah. Awesome. Let's pray over this water because as uh, it's ordinary water, we are ordinary people, but with God's grace, we've become extraordinary. So let's pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon this water here that it would become sanctified and holy for us so that we might um, welcome AJ into your wonderful grace that precedes even our own knowledge. And so God, uh, may your spirit reign upon us um, now and always. And it's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Put that down. All right, AJ, this is cold, so I apologize. So. <laughs> Alan James Williams, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit work within you and through you that having been born of water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So I'm going to give you all some. Yes, everybody can give AJ a round of applause. <laughs> and Dan Chase. So yeah. You did awesome. So I'm going to give you all this. This is a baptismal certificate. So when he wants to remember that this happened. And then here is a little gift for AJ, a little cross for everybody. To, you know, so he can hold that and silently pray as an infant now. So everybody. AJ, we're so glad that you are uh, part of Christ's family. We are so glad you're part of the body of Christ. We know God's grace is upon you even now. And so congregation, please welcome AJ Williams into the life of the church. Turning my mic on. How about now? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you all for participating. I know it's weird and it's awkward when there's a video playing, um, but it's really important that when we do things like baptisms or joinings um, through the video, those of you who sent comments in on the Facebook feed and those of you here in person, that's a way that we can continue to worship together in this really weird time where it feels like we do nothing together, right? So thank you all for participating in that. Um, let's give God and AJ just one more round of applause now that we, there we go. Now that we feel less awkward about it. <laughs> so when you start to see um, that family as soon as they come back and when they're ready and when we're all, I don't know, less distanced, uh, be sure and congratulate them. Um, it is a special, special thing to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. And we want to make sure that we celebrate AJ upon their return to um, in-person worship when that is right for them. Um, as we continue in worship together, 
We're going to move to a time of offering, um, and I just want to send the friendly reminder out that your stewardship cards can be brought um, forward during the offering time. They can be brought to the office during the week, Um, but as we continue to plan and dream for, and I hate using the word liminal season, but it's just what we're doing here. As we plan for the liminal season of 2021, we really appreciate the ways in which um, your generosity is allowing us um, to plan for the uncertain, to plan for the what if, to plan for um, even in some cases the worst case scenario, right? Um, So thank you all for your generosity that allows us to do that together. Um, A couple of instructions for offering time. If you're here in person and you would like to bring your offering as you feel let during the instrumental, um, that'll be the time for you to do that. There's bowls here in the front. There's also one in the back for you to keep your distance. And then we also, if you're online, you can go to creekwoodumc.org slash give, and that will find help you find all of the different portals for things like your online stewardship card as well as designated giving. Let's pray over our gifts and offerings this morning. God, we ask all of the gifts given this morning in person and online and this week might be used to continue to bring about your kingdom on earth. It might be used to comfort the lonely to heal the sick and to show your love to all people. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. As we prepare in our hearts and our minds for our message this morning, our scripture passage, we just have one this time, comes from the book of Psalms, and this is a portion from 113. I don't have it memorized, so... Thank you. All right. This is from Psalm 113 from a Bible, the old-fashioned way. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated high, who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say, thanks be to God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. 
forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So I've been listening to this podcast. It's by a guy named Michael Lewis who wrote Moneyball uh, about the Oakland A's and the farm system and all the the, uh, dynamics of uh, economics and baseball. And it's called Against the Rules and examines roles of authority in our lives. Uh, And the second season is on the role of coaches uh, that have pervaded across uh, sports, but not only into sports, but into life coaches and application coaches and all the coaching that goes on around us. And in the gist of the definition of what a coach is, is largely someone who helps you gain the control so that you can have the success that you're looking for. Uh, And he does often draw on his sports experience, especially his baseball experience, which I noticed as around the same time as I'm listening to this podcast, the World Series has started. I've been watching the playoffs as they've unfolded. And I have to talk about baseball today because TCU is terrible this year, so I can't brag on my football team. But uh, so in, in listening to this uh, podcast about coaches, I was also scrolling through, I think it was, um, I think it was Sports Illustrated was the uh, website I was on, and I noticed this picture with a caption. It was posted by um, Alex Wood's wife. And Alex Wood is a relief pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, who are currently in the, in the World Series right now. And um, this was posted before Game 2 of the World Series. Uh, and it basically had to do with, don't worry, y'all. Alex has got his lucky turquoise shirt on today. We're going to be fine. So like hockey players don't shave during the playoffs. There are people who have like not washed their underpants for the entire length of a playoffs and football and other type of things. I mean, you have to measure the stink versus the success that you really want in life. Um, but Alex Wood, um, before game five of the National League Championship Series, which the Los Angeles Dodgers were down three games to one, which is a hard hole to climb out of. No one really thought they were going to be able to do it. Um, before game five, he had this new turquoise shirt that he put on and wore to the ballpark that day before he changed into his uniform. And uh, when they won, he thought, well, I've never done that before. And baseball players, like almost by nature, seem to be the most superstitious group of people that you've ever met. Now, mind you, Alex Wood did not pitch in Game 5 of the National League Championship Series at all. He's a relief pitcher. He never went into the game. But he was determined that they won that game because that turquoise shirt controlled the fate of the universe and caused them to beat the Braves that game. So guess what he did before Game 6? Put the shirt on, right? Still hadn't been washed. Put the shirt on. They won Game 6. He didn't pitch in Game 6, but he wore the shirt. So guess what he did before Game 7? Wore the shirt, right? Didn't pitch in game seven. Had no control of the outcome of any of the actual pitch bat, any of the the base running that goes on in the actual game. But he wore the shirt. So game one of the World Series comes on. What does Alex Wood put on before the game? Turquoise shirt, right? Hasn't been washed. Stinky as ever. But they're getting success because the shirt controls the entire destiny of the outcome of the universe. Um, So his wife posted before game two. Guess what happens in game two? They lose, right? This is called a superstition. And it's what coaches uh, have, uh, what the the podcast talks about is, is that there are so many of us in so many areas of life that we will give control over to an inanimate object believing that it has success, a control of success over the endeavor that we're going for. And it has to be an inanimate object psychologically because we have to somehow have control over the thing that actually has control. But superstitions are giving away our control in hopes that they will bring us success. And we all do this on some level. It used to be that when you crossed over a railroad track, what you do, you put your hand on, you put your finger on a screw, right? Or else you were going to die that day. Uh, Or you're going by a graveyard. What do you do? You hold your breath so that you don't end up in the graveyard afterward. How many of you do Knock on wood, right after you uh, say something that is positive in life, because who wouldn't want to say positive things in life, right? As soon as you say something positive, if you don't knock on wood, something negative is going to happen, because this wood right here controls the fate of the universe and everything that's going to happen to you. Um, and, And it seeps into our prayer life. I remember when I was at Emory, I was at seminary, and every mailbox one day was filled with an envelope. And, and we went, and it was an envelope from a certain church in Atlanta, big church. And uh, it had an um, 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. And there were five circles on it. There was a big circle in the middle, and there was little circles at each corner. And with specific instructions, it says, If you pray this way, 
then you will be blessed with what you pray for. And you're supposed to put your head in the middle, you're supposed to put your hands in these two circles right here, and you're supposed to put your knees right there, which I don't know if you can get the visual of that, but it's almost as impossible as me singing like Christy Edstrom. I mean, it was really uh, kind of an impossible task. And it, with, the, with the piece of paper came a little like what used to be a mustard packet, I think, only the mustard had been taken out and like water had been put in. So it was supposed to be this holy, blessed water. And so you're supposed to kneel like this on the paper, and then you're supposed to also have your tail come up and uh, put the holy water around your head three times clockwise. I'm, and this is the detailed instruction. It says, if you do it this way, then you will be blessed with what you pray for. And that's extreme. That's the extreme example of how prayer can be a superstition, right? We are taking control and putting it on this piece of paper and in this mustard packet and saying, if you do it this way, or even in the words that we say or the way that we say them. Um, but more mainstream is in the year 2000, I remember a book called Prayer of Jabez. If you recall the Prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkinson, it was this little book. It was easy to read. And first time I read it, I thought, wow, this is really, really great. And then I, I, I dove into it a little bit more later on in life. And there's, it, it comes from this prayer by a guy named Jabez. It's this random part of First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. And Jabez prays this very specific prayer that is very incredibly self-centered. And, and one of the lines in there is, expand my territory. And, and when I first read it in high school, I thought it was, you know, I just skimmed through it. I thought it was, expand my territory. Help me meet as many people as possible to spread God's love to whoever and wherever that I possibly can. But when I went back and reread it, it was, expand my territory like, Lord, give me acreage and control over more people. And even in the book goes in to say, like, Give me a BMW because a BMW would help me out in my ministry, getting for places with better gas mileage and more effectively. And I'm telling you, it's, that was year 2000. I'm still driving a Honda Accord, y'all. So it doesn't always work out the way that we want it to work out like. Because did Alex Wood win game two? No, the Dodgers lost. Right? When we give control away, we're not guaranteed anything. It just makes us feel better for some reason. And so the coaches would say superstitions actually hurt you. They hurt your faith. They hurt your practice. They hurt your performance because you are taking your control and giving it away to something random. And there's so much other chaos in the world. So what they always recommend is they say you find a routine. And routines look like this. Nomar Garcia Parra. Very unique routine when he steps into the batter's box. Tightens his glove up, wristbands. There's the feet. Do a little two-step. Fox have had some long at bats so far in this ball game against Rosado. And what a gorgeous day at Skydome. Beautiful day. If you're not at the ball game, that's what you do. That's just a routine beforehand. He has developed into a superstar. Yes, he has. Did it so this is a 20-second clip from a two-minute YouTube video put together by Major League Baseball to highlight how Nomar Garcia Parra would do the exact same routine, not before every at bat, but every time he stepped into the batter's box, which means he could have foul tipped seven pitches in a row, stepped out of the batter's box to compose himself, and he would still come in, adjust the wristbands, restrap the batting gloves, tap his feet like a tap dancer a couple times, adjust his helmet, and he does 14 different things to clear his mind to get ready for that at bat. And this is what the coaches would say, is that a routine is what centers and grounds us. There is so much chaos in the world that we, instead of trying to place control in some random thing in the chaos that will magically bless us, instead we ignore the chaos and we focus on what we can control. And by controlling what we can control, we are able to have a sense of peace and a sense of comfort to be able to go forth and be confident towards success. And, and we do routines all the time. We wake up at the same time to go to the gym and do the same exercises every morning so that we feel confident toward our goals of weight loss or healthy living or whatever. Many of you have sat in the same seat in church for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, one of the funny things about COVID is that people who have been attending regularly in person still sit in the same seat or in the same general area that they are used to because it is one thing you can control to your experience. When you're going to a game, when you're going to a church, when you're going something, you, you still want to control that experience. And so I know if I sit in the same area, I'll know what to expect, which means I can know what to, uh, I'll know what I'm going to see, which means I know I can, what I can expect. It means I have some semblance of control over what happens. And we do this in prayer as well. We say the same prayer before we sit down for a meal 
Um, if you skip prayers at bedtime, your kids will not be able to go to sleep, right? Because we missed something. Prayers become routine. Have you ever tried perhaps asking a congregation to change a word in the Lord's Prayer at one point or another? Right? It gets hard because we say the same things over and over for 500 years and they become comfortable to us. They become even peaceful to us. And on some level, the prayer becomes not just a prayer where we're asking God our Father, God our Mother, God our Creator, where we're really transcending this life into something else. What it becomes is more of a comfort level of if it doesn't happen this way, then I'm thrown off. Then it becomes more chaotic. And, and the reason I have a routine is because I want to ignore the chaos around me and I want to focus in on what I can control. And so the prayer that we do before bedtime or mealtime or Lord's Prayer or Apostles' Creed or whatever, the prayer becomes what I can control about my experience with God as opposed to being in a transcendent place where I might receive the Word of God or where I might put myself in the place of God. And so while routines can lead to more success, they often can be very f self focused as well. We can get withdrawn into success being determined by my success or my goals or my pathway in the world. And so I want to suggest that the ending of the Lord's Prayer brings us to a, a point somewhere in between superstition and, uh, and routine. And in fact, supersedes everything that sports psychologists or sports coaches or coaches or psychologists could ever teach us about anything. And to get there, we got another baseball player. I'm going to introduce you to uh, world champion from last year, Anthony Rendon. Listen to his words. Uh, KB actually is a, the artist. I know I'm you like sure. always quoting, quoting an artist. And he says, um, and they, they labeled me as a Christian rapper, but all I know is I want to be more Christian than rapper. And so I was thinking about that. I was like, uh, I want to be known as the Christian baseball player. And I'm still like trying to grow and grow into that. But in the end, like I want to be more Christian than baseball player. I was thinking about... So it reminds me of what um, Trevor Lawrence, who's the all-world, probably Heisman-winning QB for Clemson Tigers this year. Uh, before the season, they were talking about, uh, Trevor, you seem so composed out on the field, and you're about to break all these records and win all these games, and how do you maintain your composure? How do you maintain control on the field? And it was interesting how he flipped it, and he said, well, the field is the only thing I can control. I know the play. I know the movement. I know where the receivers are going to be. I know that I can make the throw. I know that I'm good enough. That is what I can control. But where I find success is when I lose control outside of the game. And he started talking about his relationship with Jesus. And he started talking about how that football is just a game. Baseball is just a game. Even some of the things that you know, our job is some, on some level just a job. And that there are things that, yes, we can control and we can impact the world through those things. But ultimately, outside of our routines, there's so much more that we have absolutely no control of whatsoever. And so I want to call Anthony Rendon's statement, Trevor Lawrence's statement, and the last line of the Lord's Prayer, um, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's not a superstition and it's not a routine that we do. It's a doxology. And a doxology means glory saying. It's a repetitive statement, but it is one that moves us out of our own routine and out of our own self into a place where we can give control away, but give control away not to an inanimate object, but give control away to something or some being, some deity that has a larger sense of control, recognizing the larger sense of control over the chaos that we perceive uh, around us. And, and normally we think of doxology, if you grew up in a traditional setting, you would sing the doxology after you would take the offering up to, up to the worship, uh, up to the altar. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because what is the single most thing that makes us feel in control of our life? And that is when our bank account is healthy and when, when we have money. And so people would pass the plates or in old time they would have little sticks with baskets on them and they would put them in your face until you gave something and then and and there would be two thoughts that went through people's heads is um you put money in you'd be like oh shoot i just wish i wouldn't have given that much because i really wanted to go to denny's today after who goes to denny's you know wherever wherever you wanted to go eat afterward right um you know i really want to go out to eat afterward and i really shouldn't have put that much money in the plate um, or the second thought is, man, I really gave well today, and I'm so great, and I'm awesome because I did this, which kind of sounds like the person before Jesus says the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 that Jesus is responding against, right? And so it's either, oh, man, I wish I wouldn't have given that much, or, oh, man, I wish I would have, uh, I'm just so awesome for giving that much. And then the next line of, like, the classical benediction is, praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? And so it doesn't, 
It's to, to comfort those people who think they gave too much and that, well, all those blessings came from God anyway and to humble that person who thinks they're just amazing for giving so much because, well, all of that was God's to begin with anyway. Right? A doxology is one that admits that we don't have control, but in admitting that we have control, then we have guidance because God is a God who uh, ultimately is, is setting the path for us and setting the standard. So when we admit at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we've been trying to not be led into temptation. We've been trying to uh, forgive our trespasses or forgive our enemies and love our enemies. We've been seeking our daily bread from something. And what the final line of the Lord's Prayer is, is this admission that well, as much as we try and control all of those things, if we are simply trying to build a routine that is based on our success, we're never going to be able to do those things. That the only way we can do those things, the only way we can live out everything we've asked God for and told God we're going to do is if we get on our knees and if we submit to the control of one who knows more than we do. If we offer a doxology, a glory saying of there is something larger than I am, larger than we are, that will allow me to align my behaviors and actions to the greater wisdom of God. And there's an interesting ironic twist behind where this line came from because um, if you read through Matthew chapter 6, you will not find this line. It's not from Scripture. Um, and the irony is that it was added in 1549 um, based on a William Tyndale English translation of the Bible um, when Queen Elizabeth came to power in England. And Queen Elizabeth was trying to do the middle way, but she was also trying to pull England out of the Catholic uh, purview of religion, and so she was, a, she was largely a Protestant. And Protestants have, took a great pride in um, being Bible-based, Bible-literal people. So the great twist of irony is that the Bible-literal, Bible, really fundamentalist Protestants of those days added a line to the prayer that Jesus offered, and we've comfortably been me messing up Scripture for about 500 years now, uh, or a little over 500 years now as good Protestants that we are. Um, so they added the, this line, and it was largely to distinguish themselves from the Catholics. Because the Catholics, they felt like, had put the glory and the power forever in the hands of the Pope and the Church, and they were trying to take it back from them. So they added this line to make sure that when we are seeking our daily bread, we're seeking it from God. They made sure that when we were seeking our trespasses, we were, uh, when we were forgiving our trespasses, we were being forgiven by God. They tried to make sure that it was directly. Now, uh, this became such a very popular thing in the English-speaking world that the Catholic Church, according to my research, in 1969, after Vatican II, adopted it themselves as well. Um, because they just found that, one, everyone was saying it, and two, it made sense. Because there are so many competing voices trying to tell us what daily bread looks like and, and what daily bread we should pursue. There's so many different ways of trying to control who we are forgiving and who we are not forgiving. There are so many different ways of trying to love our neighbor and so many different ways or, or voices in our heads trying to tell us what our control should be or how we should gain control, whether it be a superstition or whether it be a routine. And so uh, the Catholic Church said, yeah, the Protestants were right about this. There's got to be some level where we recognize that no matter what our routine looks like, it's still not enough. No matter what kind of power we have in the world, it's still not enough. That no matter how we try and live this out, it's still not enough. There are things that are going to happen in this world because God is the only one who is going to make them happen, right? If I do wake up singing like Christy Edstrom, it is because God has given me a high soprano voice to be able to sing like Christy Edstrom. That is not going to happen on its own. But at the same time, submitting to God gives me a pathway so that when I am confused about what my next step is, I can look to the person of Jesus and say, this is what God's pathway looks like, and I can try and submit fully to that pathway. And the, the, the question in all of this is, in all of the control that we're trying to gain so that we have success, would we have more success if we were controlled or if we lost control to a God who we sing praise songs to? This is why I picked a psalm for today. I mean, I didn't have a scripture from the Lord's Prayer to draw off on because we're preaching on something that's not biblical, but um, it's biblical in the way that this, the Hebrews would gather together for worship and they would sing psalms like Psalm 113 and they would praise be to God who is above us. Praise be to God who looks down. Praise be to God. And they would humble themselves together. And then the, the great thing about Psalm 113 specifically is that, that last part where it talks about that it will give a, a barren woman a child, a home, 
is directly referencing Hannah, who is in 1 Samuel. She's the mother of Samuel, who becomes the great prophet, who anoints King David to be the king, who was found herself barren, which in Hebrew society basically meant if you can't have a kid, especially a male kid, you're just kind of an outcast. Well, she can't do this on her own. As much routine as she wants to do, as much superstition as she's practiced, perhaps, she can't do this on her own, and so she goes to God and says, God, I, if, you, if we can do this together, if you will give me this child, I will fully give it over to you. I will give it fully over to you because I trust that if this happens in your providence that we will go forward together and I will promise to live my life in your kingdom and no other kingdom. And sure enough, she is given Samuel, so then Samuel is given up to the temple, and I think she has more kids after that. But it, they're singing praise to a God who uplifts people from their lack of control, who gives them a sense of success within a greater schema that gives everyone success. They're singing about the poor being uplifted. They're singing about everyone having the opportunity. And this is where our routines tend to be too inward focused. And it may just be better if we were to say, not only at the end of the Lord's Prayer, but every day, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Or because no one has said thine in 500 years, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And on some level, it's just got to be an admission by each of us every day to say, this is not my world. This is not fully my life. These are not fully my resources. This is not fully all mine. There is no routine that is going to give me completion. There is no superstition that is going to make this all happen for me. If I want to see success, it means that we have to humble ourselves for God's way and God's way alone. And I wonder if it isn't better for us to be controlled on some level. In all of our quest for freedom and all of our quest for liberty, more people find it in the pathway of Jesus Christ and the redemption offered through Christ than I see through all the routines we try and build up for ourselves, all the power we try and keep for ourselves. And I think that's a challenging thing, but I also hope it's comforting and peace-giving. I think that's why we continue to say the Lord's Prayer over and over again. It's not so we have control over our relationship with God or control over what happens in the church service or simply so that we feel peaceful about saying the same words as people have been saying since you know, Jesus or Matthew wrote down in Matthew 6. I think ultimately it's comforting for us to know that we're not alone. I think on some level it's comforting for us to know that God is going to do things that we have no control over. I think it's comforting because everything that God has done, God has shown to be ultimately more wise than us, ultimately more loving than us, ultimately more forgiving than us. And if God is going to continue to do those things, and God is going to use us to do those things, that brings me a sense of peace. And so we wake up and we say, yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. And even though we're giving ourselves away, it means we're getting everything back. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are the God and the giver of life. Over and over again, we found that the more that we give to you, the more life we receive back, not in a mystical transaction, but simply in knowing the way, the truth, the life, the forgiveness, the love, the grace, the peace, all of those things of self-actualization that tell us who we are, that we are loved, that we are blessed, we are forgiven, we are community, we are together. All of that comes, Lord, in your name in your presence, in your peace. So may we fall on our knees, may we stand up high and lift our hands to the heavens, praising your name each and every moment of our lives with everything that we do, lifting people to see your glory and yours alone for God. That is our faith. Trusting in you when we have not seen the outcome that ultimately your way is better. So Lord, may we place our trust in you and may our routines be based on that trust. May our lives be a doxology to the goodness of your spirit. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So before we sing our closing song and, and we go and celebrate God's love out in the world, we'll have a few announcements.
uh, that I want to offer up, and one of those is next Sunday, November 1st, is one of those rare occasions where All Saints Sunday, or All Saints Day, actually falls on All Saints Sunday, so, um, or on a Sunday, November 1st falls on a, on a Sunday, and so uh, we're going to do a special communion liturgy in, in worship, but um, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. around the worship center and around the campus, um, Carrie Lynn and her team are going to be setting up different prayer stations. Um, for those of you who may have lost somebody or those who just want to participate with people who have lost or those people who want to grieve just the year that 2020 has been for so many people, um, we'd love for you to come up and take part in those stations literally from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. whenever you want to get up here. And one of the important things about that is, is some of the stations are going to be artistic and, um, and whether you're an artist or not, we want you to participate in those because you are going to help shape what is on the altar during the whole next sermon series that we talk about giving thanks, parentheses, even in 2020. Um, and so we want your, um, your uh, words, your images, all of those things to be up here um, as a center of God's presence to communicate out what we need to give thanks for as well as what we need from God going into 2021. And so um, please come up here, um, not only for our sakes or for the church's sake, but for your own soul's sake as well. It'll be a great time of reflection for everybody. Um, the next uh, announcement is um, just a reminder that uh, coming up at 4.30 today, we've got our outdoor worship, uh, especially for those of you who are worshiping online with us. If you are uncomfortable gathering in this in-person space with all the people who are here, uh, you can come sit outside with us, bring your own chair. And this Sunday, uh, this afternoon, we're doing Blessing of the Animals, which I think this may be one of the first times we've ever done that here at Creekwood. So people are bringing their dogs, their cats. We hear there's a fish coming. I have blessed an iguana before. If anybody wants to bring an iguana, uh, bring your horses out. Whatever it is, we'll, uh, it's going to be a shorter service because we know animals don't have the same devotional level as you do. And so, um, but they are loved by God, and we want to lift them up before God. So come out for that. And then another thing happening today as a reminder is uh, Creekwood Student Ministries um, is hosting a Halloween party. So let's listen to Kat. Hi. This year's CSM Halloween parties are going to be in the pumpkin patch, Sunday, October 25th. Note that the times are just a little bit different to accommodate our outdoor worship and blessing of the animals that evening. Fifth and sixth grade will be before outdoor worship from 3 to 4.30, and seventh through twelfth grade will be following outdoor worship 5 to 6.30. Both parties will be keeping social distancing, requiring masks, the kind that actually cover your face. Come in costume, bring your own lawn chair, we'll have prepackaged snacks. Can't wait to see you. Don't forget your mask. Uh, we look forward to that happening, but I want to, um, for a special SPR recognition, I want to invite Jim Ginrich is going to um, recognize one of our staff people. Thank you, David. Um, it's my honor on behalf of the SPRC and the whole congregation to give a, a special uh, certificate to uh, Patrick O'Connor if he'll come forward and act surprised, even though we did this at 8.30 this morning. As he's coming forward, I'll talk a little bit about what Patrick has done and, and why we wanted to recognize him. Um, we as a congregation had to make a quick pivot to a virtual world. Uh, March 12th, it was decided that there would be no more uh, in-person services. And so between the 12th and the 15th, which was our first virtual service, um, he was able to come in and learn on the fly. Number one, get us up and running. And then as we went on, get better quality, uh, better reliability in our video. He's learned a lot about the software from a broadcast perspective, the hardware. He's got ideas on how to take us even further. And we just really appreciate everything he's done and the devotion to this and, and all the work that he's done for it. And congratulations to you, Patrick. Awesome. Now let's stand up and sing our closing song. All right, if, you're, if you're online, stand up and sing and shake something. I actually have a superstition. I think and believe that the louder you sing, the more amazing things that are going to happen to you today. <laughs>
Go forth knowing that the more that we claim that the Lord is the ultimate king over uh, the glory, the power, and the righteousness forever, that we also will show people that same way and truth and life. And so go forward and be someone who loves God, loves your neighbor, and loves yourself. Amen. We're so glad you decided to join us in worship today where we got to celebrate the love that God has through us in Jesus Christ. And I hope that if that is something you want to explore more, perhaps you'll send me an email. My name is David Lesner. You can find my email address on our website, creekwoodumc.org, where you can also find lots of other ways to learn about the love of God and share the love of God and serve in the name of Christ, as well as give to the missions and ministries of the church. You can find our core missions on there and learn more about the ways in which we hope to empower the world 
Um, and again, we're so glad you chose to join with us in worship this morning. We hope to see you again next week, uh, either online or in person. And it was so great worshiping with you. God bless.